I hope you're having a great day. Uh, it's beautiful outside. I hope you got a chance to go outside, walk around between your studies with uh, the classes that you have to do for the high school. Uh, we're going to wait just a few minutes like we normally do to have everybody log on, and then we'll get into today's subject of alcohol and drugs. We do have to uh, catch up on a few points with uh, fatigue. That's where we uh, left off from yesterday's class, so we'll start there. But remember to uh, sign in on comments. There's Owen. And then remember to text your name to me when we start the session and when we end so I know that you've been here the whole time. So I can check from the time we started at 4 o'clock to the time that we actually end. This is Madison, Clayton. While we're waiting, I want to show you something that's kind of cool. Uh, can everybody see that? Okay, this was given to me by, my dad was a driver's ed teacher and uh, he had some things lying around. So I'm accumulating a lot of the things that he had and I'm going to start to incorporate them into my, my little office, my little room that I teach class. There's Luca, Natalie, Hey Squad, uh, Mark's here. Um, I want to say thank you to those that did uh, chapter 18. Um, those are not difficult questions to answer, uh, but a few people have not given me their response to penalties for drinking and driving. What would happen to someone that was arrested for driving under the influence? And then what would happen to somebody that uh, caused a um, vehicular homicide? So someone passed away uh, in the crash. What do you think their penalties uh, should be? So we're going to kind of gear towards that tomorrow, but I wanted you to at least started to uh, think about it so we can discuss it. Um, hey, Devin. So we're getting more and more people. I'm going to kind of switch over to where we were. Oh, before we um, get going, let's see if, if this will work. What am I in? I'm in movie. It's unlocked. So I'll move this over. Let's see if this works. Boom. Uh, one thing I forgot to talk about yesterday was what would happen if you were caught with snow on top of your vehicle? So if you take a look at the picture right here, that this is from the UNH Police Department, so a local um, police department. It gives you the RSA, which is uh, how laws are written in New Hampshire. It stands for Revised Statutes Annotated. Uh, the penalty for snow on your roof is $250 and $500 for your first offense and then with increased penalties for subsequent offend, uh, offenses. So make sure that uh, you have that down and that is in your manual. Um, let's get out of that. Let's go to fatigue. There we go. So what we were talking about yesterday was what time do you normally um, fall asleep Monday through Friday and how are ways that you could fight fatigue while driving what I want you to write down in your notes, and this is where we had to kind of end. I want you to add a half hour to the time that you listed. So if you said 10 o'clock, I want you to write down in your notes 1030. Because what statistics have found is that a half hour after your body wants to shut down, if you're still awake and if you're awake driving, you're going to start to close your eyes. You're going to start to get tired. So what I want you to write down in your notes is that a half hour after I normally go to sleep, if I'm still out driving for at least a, a half hour or so, that is going to be a struggle for my concentration. Now, you may not be nodding off. And think about it. How many times have you watched TV and you're tired and all of a sudden you catch yourself getting the nods? Now, whether you realize this or not, but every time that you close your eyes, the next time that you do it, it's slightly longer until eventually you get the head nods. Now, be honest, how many of you have fallen asleep while watching TV and when you wake up, you're wondering, is this the same TV program? Have I been asleep for 15 seconds, a minute, is it five minutes? Is it half hour? 
you can't do that while you're driving. You will get the nods. You will get where you get the eye droop, and you'll see this in a video. But we have found that a half hour after your normal bedtime and you're still out driving for another half hour, uh, you are going to have some lane drift and you're going to have a hard time maintaining a speed and position. So let's uh, go into the video that I wanted to show you uh, yesterday. Back at 744 this morning on Today investigates a serious hazard facing young drivers that is often overlooked. NBC's senior investigative correspondent Lisa Myers is in Bethesda, Maryland with details. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning, Meredith. We're talking about driving while tired. We've all done it, but experts say it's particularly dangerous for teens. Fatigue is a factor in at least 100,000 crashes every year, and most of those involve young drivers who get behind the wheel when they're drowsy and never make it home. I sit and I replay that night over and over and over again, and I thought, I'm just so close to home, I can make it. That night, Rusty Burris was 18 years old with a bright future, but driving home from his girlfriend's house, his life changed forever. I knew I was tired, but I didn't really feel that I was that tired, and driving home, I got just a mile from home and fell asleep at the wheel. In seconds, Rusty's car drifted off this country road and rolled over. The impact crushed his roof and his spine. Rusty would never walk again. I've fallen asleep and crashed my car one time. And that's all it took. Experts say every day, millions of teens are dangerously tired when they get behind the wheel. More than a third of teens say they drive drowsy on a regular basis, and more than half of all fatigue-related crashes involve drivers under 25. It's a huge problem, and it's probably bigger now than it was in the past. Tom Balkin is president of the National Sleep Foundation. He says adolescents go through changes in their circadian rhythms that make it nearly impossible for them to fall asleep before 11 p.m. Combine that with early morning classes, after-school jobs, and late-night socializing, and it's easy to see why teens are chronically sleep-deprived. The average college student needs about eight and a half to nine and a half hours of sleep. Virtually none of them get that. In fact, they average six hours of sleep per night. So how can fatigue affect their driving? Today, sir, I may help you. To find out, we set up an unscientific experiment with three Today Show interns. Patrick, Meredith, and Bryant, all college students who habitually drive after not much sleep. Last summer, I was driving tired almost every day. When it's final season, there's no sleep. That's when the drowsy driving starts to kick in. For our experiment, we kept our kids up for an entire night, no naps or caffeine. Experts told us that would simulate the level of fatigue students typically suffer after a week of insufficient sleep. You don't want to hit a cone. Then we brought them here to the Skip Barber Driving School in Connecticut, where with safety instructors by their side, we put them through two road tests, a tight, twisty loop and an emergency lane change. We're testing today their ability to instantaneously react to an unexpected situation. Hitting any cones would be the equivalent of a crash in the real world. The day before, all three had driven these courses wide awake and aced them. I haven't hit any cones, and I think it's not that hard. I feel pretty confident. Once you got the hang of it, it, was, uh, it wasn't that bad. But watch the difference when they're drowsy. Our kids swerve wildly through turns, hitting cone after cone after cone. If that had been a real-world situation, he would have had a pretty violent crash. Inside the car, you'd never know it. Even as they crash, our drowsy students remain slack-jawed and dazed. Patrick clearly is giddy. He, he almost seems drunk. In many ways, driving drowsy is very much like dra driving drunk. We showed the video to Tom Balkin, our sleep expert. He says drowsiness, like alcohol, can severely impair a driver's reflexes, judgment, and awareness. Should parents be as worried about kids driving when they're too tired as they are about them texting while driving or driving drunk? Absolutely. Especially, he says, on long, boring roads like the one where Rusty crashed. 
So we also tested our kids on this monotonous two-mile track, each driving it for half an hour. At first I thought I did okay. You know, I thought I was in control. But their dead stares tell a different story. Balkan says these are signs of a dangerous condition called microsleeps, where your eyes stay open, but your brain is falling asleep. And this is the kind of situation where uh, anything uh, unexpected actually could throw them. Like these surprise cones. We put them up on our kids' final lap to simulate a stopped car or a person unexpectedly in their path. Before the test, we made sure an alert driver could easily stop in time. But watch our drowsy kids. Whoa! They're so disoriented, they barely hit the brakes. Whoa, okay, that was fun. <laughs> I just killed somebody, didn't I? Imagine if that cone had been someone's pet or child. After I sat there for a minute and realized what I did, that's a tough pill to swallow. That was an eye-opener because that thing that you never know is going to happen that will just come out of nowhere. That's what you have to be prepared for. And if you're tired, you might not be. A realization that came too late for Rusty Burris. When you're tired, stop. Don't push it. Because even though you've only got a mile left, you could be throwing your entire life away trying to drive one more mile. Now, sleep e experts say parents should treat drowsy driving just like drunk driving. Tell your kid if he's tired to call you. You'll come pick him up. Or if he gets tired on a long drive, tell him to pull off the road, get some caffeine, and take a 20-minute nap. That should help revive him. Meredith. All right, Lisa Myers, thank you. Okay, a couple of things I want to write down from that, uh, that video. Uh, one that should have been very alarming to you is that um, they all aced the course uh, earlier uh, the day before. So they had this self-confidence, and this is what happens when we get our license. We think we're a good driver. And then when we start finding ourselves being less than perfect behind the wheel, we justify continuing our drive. And in reality, you've got to pull back and kind of implement some of the things that we talked about yesterday about caffeine, get out, let someone else drive, start to, um, to put into practice some of the things that you know is safer. Uh, you saw in the video that when they went back to be retested, even though it was an overcast rainy day, that their reflexes were much slower and they could not react quick enough uh, to the pedestrian uh, that flipped up when they came up over the hill. And even some of the corners that they came around, they were taking them too fast and too wide, which isn't very good. Uh, the other thing I want you to write down from the video, and I think I may have this coming up, it's your reaction time and the way that you drive, it's like you're intoxicated. And it's kind of a good lead into what we're going to be doing uh, in the next five minutes, talking about alcohol and drugs, because it does suppress your reflexes and your thinking process. But we'll take a look at that. I think I only have a few more slides. Um, so there's, it's as bad as, uh, DWI when you get up into your longer hours driving while uh, fatigued. Uh, let's go back to this video right here. So let's go here. Volvo Cars now introduces a new technique that warns tired or unconcentrated drivers before they risk becoming a danger to traffic. This is world news that will save lives. The new technique that is called driver alert control is based on a camera and a number of sensors that read off the sidelines and other markings on the road in order to discover whether or not the driver is tired and unconcentrated. Simply explained, the technique is based on how the car behaves on the road. A control unit stores the information and then makes an assessment as to whether the driver should be warned by means of an audio signal. Driver alert control is a system that uh, analyzes the driving behavior of the driver and uh, if it detects that the driver is unconcentrated or tired, it alerts the driver. Tiredness-related traffic accidents are a global problem. 
In the USA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration estimates that 100,000 traffic accidents per year are caused by tired drivers who fall asleep at the wheel. Of these accidents, 1,500 people are killed and more than 70,000 injured. Volvo's new technique is therefore welcomed with open arms. We think it's great that the automakers are putting this kind of technology into vehicles. You know, we're seeing things like drowsy driver alert. We're looking at uh, efforts to mitigate the collisions, that is, apply the brakes before they happen. This is very good technology, we hope. Uh, ultimately, we'll be doing research on it to see just how well it works in real crashes. The problem with tired and unconcentrated drivers is the same in Europe. And at the Swedish Road Administration, they are convinced that this new technique will both reduce the number of tiredness-related accidents and save lives. I think as a complement to crash prevention or crash injury prevention, which industry has worked with for many, many years, to complement that with the accident reduction in those modern systems is a very positive trend that we see. A huge amount of research lies behind the driver alert control and several studies show that distracted drivers cause up to 90% of all traffic accidents. We have been driving with a lot of different test subjects, uh, both on test tracks and on, on public roads, just to see that uh, the system can detect that the driver might be unconcentrated or tired and also that it doesn't give any false warnings. In the USA, a quarter of all accidents and a third of all fatal accidents on American highways as a result of single vehicle accidents and frontal crashes are caused by temporary distraction. This new technique also offers a system that warns the driver if the car crosses any of the road markings without any obvious reason. The system, called lane departure warning, could be able to reduce this type of accident by between 30 and 40 percent. Volvo Cars now also has a solution to reduce the problem of rear-end collisions. Rear-end collisions represent one-third of all reported accidents, and in more than 50 percent of cases, the driver has not braked at all before the collision. Collision warning with auto brake can mean the difference between a serious accident resulting in severe personal injuries and a minor consequence for all involved. We have a camera and a radar which looks upon the area in front of the car and recognizes vehicles in front of the car and through that data it takes the decision whether it should warn the driver or if it should warn and brake for the driver. In this case too the system is based on a camera and a radar that warns the driver and if the driver doesn't brake then the car does it itself. Researchers are in agreement that it is by means of preventive safety measures that traffic accidents can be radically reduced. We know that there are still a lot of crashes that occur out there. We've, vehicles have improved a lot in the U.S. over the past couple of decades, yet we still have over 40,000 deaths in motor vehicle crashes each year. And, you know, one of the things that we would hope we can do is to begin to prevent some of the crashes before they occur. Most of our success so far has come because we've improved the crash worthiness of vehicles. Once you're into a crash, we now know a lot more about how to protect you in there. But if we could just prevent the crash from occurring, that would really help a lot. Okay. Um, basically, we're going to see the numbers continually going down with car fatalities because we're doing a better job with equipping our cars with technology to get us out of situations that we're not aware of. Um, I want you to write down, just like we did with seat belts being um, passive or active, this is a passive device that is getting to be a standard uh, feature in cars. I think as we progress in the next couple of years and things get a little bit cheaper, it's going to be standard equipment. Right now, I think midline to upper scale vehicles will have this technology right in it as a feature. Uh, you could probably get it as an add-on right now, but only for mid to higher end vehicles. So you're not going to find it on the real cheap vehicles. But it does a good job with protecting you uh, because if you're not paying attention. Uh, the only thing that I want you to write down is that um, lane departure, uh, you got to be careful because if lines aren't available to you, then it's going to
be faulty. It's not going to be as accurate as it can be. Now, I know some cars go off GPS and uh, just like um, uh, Tesla's, okay, they're the basically self-automated um, that you just set it and take your hands off the wheel and it's based on GPS and it's going to, you know, uh, take you down the road, although they want you to be alert and somewhere near the controls if there's some type of a problem. But that is what we're, we're going towards. So I just want to um, end things right here on this section is that with weather problems, you may experience some of these situations after you get your license for the first time. So a lot of times when I teach driver's ed, especially in the summertime, we talk about snow, but we never encounter it uh, in the 10 hours you do with me or the 40 hours that you do with your parents because it's not that season. So as a licensed driver, you're going to experience a lot of these things for the first time when you're all alone. So just like learning first aid or CPR, uh, CPR, hopefully these things will come back to you, things that we've discussed now um, here in class that you go, oh yeah, this is what I need to do in this situation. And it should hopefully uh, help you to um, get out of some bad uh, weather conditions. So a few things I wanna leave you with is stay within your driving skills. So if you're a little bit leery of, of driving a car on slippery surfaces, don't go for long drives, uh, do it short drives, someplace where you could take your time. So don't be a hero. Don't think you have to drive two hours, you know, to visit a relative, um, say, I'm going to do it um, tomorrow after they've plow plowed the roads and it's a little bit safer. So always uh, practice on the side of caution. And even though a crash may not be your fault, it can still affect you physically and emotionally. Uh, I know a lot of people, they get involved in a crash and they have no desire to drive for weeks, months. And there's probably people that just totally give it up uh, entirely. I know, you know, this is a long time ago, but I had a grandfather before I was born. He was involved in a automobile crash and he never drove again in his entire life. So as long as I knew my grandfather and he passed away when I was probably in my early 20s, he never drove a car. And neither did my grandmother. So I had a set of grandparents that did not have a vehicle in their yard. They never drove. So sometimes people get so turned off by what happens bad in a vehicle, they never get behind the wheel again. And that's just not right. Couldn't happen. All right. So let's get into alcohol and drugs. Let's see if this works. Uh, I don't know if you can see the picture at all, but um, just to the left of the glass of beer, just in spirit of what we're going through right now, you can see the Corona um, beer bottle on the back. So this will be a reminder to me when I go back to this slide that uh, this is the time that I taught online uh, during the Corona virus. So uh, alcohol and drugs and driving, uh, what should I know and why? So we're gonna basically today talk about behavior and then tomorrow we're gonna talk a little bit about penalties. So let's kind of get into, um, hmm, how come that's not moving on? Well, I'm going to show um, a video and then we'll go from there. Vodka, tequila, scotch, beer, wine, rum, gin, whiskey, alcohol. Alcohol probably took 20 years of my life, and you can't get that back. Alcohol is a drug, which most people don't think it is, but it actually is. It's classed as a depressant, meaning it slows down vital functions in the body. Alcohol is made through the fermentation of fruits and grains. The process of fermentation is basically letting fruit sit and rot until it can produce a mind-altering effect when you drink it. There's different types of things you can drink that have different amounts of alcohol in them. Like a beer, if you just drink beer that has uh, 2 to 6 percent alcohol, wine is about 8 to 20 percent alcohol, and then you got your hard liquors which are uh, like vodka or whiskey, which are about 40 to 50% alcohol. When someone drinks two or more drinks, it acts as a stimulant. When they drink more than that, it acts as a depressant. 
you binge drink, what you're doing is you're just drinking repeatedly over and over large amounts and large quantities of alcohol. If you put that much alcohol in your system at one time, you can get alcohol poisoning, which could lead you to go into a coma or even kill you. 12 years old, uh, I was in the seventh grade. Uh, when I was in eighth grade, I think I was 13 years old. It became very regular at 14 years of age. 15 years old when I first started drinking. 17 years old, starting going out parties, doing things like that. At first, drinking was a sociable thing, you know, I drank with my friends. I thought I was really cool going out with all the older guys, and I'd try to show off in front of them and drink myself stupid. I just go out and party all night. By the time I was probably 15 is where I started drinking at school. Putting it in a water bottle, I would take vodka or gin, something clear that looked like water, and I would just drink in class and pop mints in my mouth. We'd go in, break into his parents' liquor cabinet, fill up our super big gulps full of ice and Everclear and then stop by 7-Eleven and fill the rest of it up with Coke and then make it to first period. I was drinking not just at parties and stuff, but after classes and after work and even at work. I waited tables, so it was very easy access to alcohol. It was just hard to say no. It was, it was so readily available and it was constantly there. My drug problem wasn't something that happened immediately. It happened so slowly that I missed the fact that I was addicted to it. It became a routine, a way of life. The only type of people I would hang out with were people who were using drugs or drinking alcohol. And it got to the point where that's all I cared about. It became far more than just a partying thing. It was um, a necessity. Without having alcohol in me, I could not function. I, I kind of became a loner because I just all I ever wanted to do was just drink and drink and drink. It felt like it was my only friend. It felt like that it was always there for me somewhere. You know, when things were going bad, I could always have a few drinks. Well, for me, it was never a few drinks. It was always a lot of drinks. I was consuming about 30 beers a day, a whole case of beer, and three quarters of a gallon of light rum. I would essentially have that and black out every night. I could do nothing but drink. 24-7, drink, pass out, drink, pass out. I literally started drinking so much that I would shake if I didn't have a drink. When I would not drink, I'd get extremely sick, deathly sick. Just really achy all over, and you have headaches, and you're so dehydrated that you just, you have no energy. Alcohol had been, you know, in and out my body so much that it had tore away some of the lining of my esophagus, and blood was creeping in. I was a physical disaster. I was that far in my addiction of physical withdrawal that when I shut that alcohol intake off, my body tried to shut down. The actual withdrawal from alcohol can kill you, for one thing, if it's too, in too intense. Uh, your body has no vitamins, or it's dehydrated, and you can have DTs, and you can seizure to death. That's terrible. I got a phone call. You know that my father was in the hospital and that he was really, really sick. Um, and that he wasn't going to make it. So the next day I got on a plane to go home. And my only way to confront this was to drink alcohol. So I showed up at the airport pretty drunk and my family, you know, saw me there and, you know, they didn't know what to say. The worst thing about it is that my father was kept conscious so that he could see me before he passed away. But instead of disgracing his memory, they'd put him on life support. I had gotten kicked out of this bar for fighting, I was beyond drunk, and uh, I was attacked and uh, raped. And I went home, and I stayed in my apartment for a week. My mom would come knocking on the door. I'd pretend I wasn't home. I felt like it was my fault. You know, I was the one that was at that bar. I was the one that was getting drunk. I went home, and I had a roommate. And for some reason, we got into an argument, which resulted in a fight and the cops got called. I blacked out for part of it, so I couldn't I couldn't figure out why I in, was waking up in jail. I drank some beer there at the uh, bar inside the, the airport. I just ordered another beer and put my backpack on and started walking through the terminal smoking a cigarette. I, I didn't care what I was supposed to be doing. And I uh, ended up getting a fight with the uh, police there at the airport. And I woke up in jail, I had staples in my head. In the military, I woke up and uh, I actually had to crawl on my hands and knees off the flight deck of the carrier because I couldn't walk. And then I got discharged from that and lost a girlfriend and a, a kid and my whole life. I drank to blackout one night. Well, sometime about an hour later, I got back up 
I went to my bedroom. My wife wasn't there. I went to the girls' bedroom, and they were all in the bed together, basically hiding from me through a blackout. And I decided right then that I couldn't stay there anymore. I was afraid I was going to hurt someone at a blackout. Now, I haven't had a drink in three years, yet I'm reminded daily of my alcohol abuse because of the long-term effects. I have horrible short-term memory, and it makes everyday life very difficult for me. Just remembering names, remembering how to do things. As a result of alcohol, I had high blood pressure, and I still have it. It destroys your internal organs, and I mean, it can destroy your brain functions, your handwriting, small motor skills. That's definitely a poison. I have liver pains, bone and muscle aches that just used to not be there, and it's not from age. I'm not that old. I should be in my prime right now, and I've probably aged myself 20 years through alcohol abuse. Alcohol is slow to kill, but it's the most hideous form of death. If I had known how sneaky and dangerous and insidious alcohol is, if somebody had kind of told me, and if I had known that it's not this symbol for a good time, I think that would have made a difference. It's not like some of the other drugs that instantly after your first time you're hooked and you're addicted to it. A lot of times, you know, most of my friends didn't even like the taste of beer when they first started drinking. It started out as something that was fun something we did on weekends. How it progressed to an everyday, all-day thing is beyond me. I have no answer to that. I do not understand how that happened, but it did. It's nothing but misery. The last 12, 13 years of my life, I've spent probably over half a million dollars, and over four or five years of that has been institutionalized, whether it be in a alcohol treatment rehab facility or, you know, incarcerated. Well, alcohol is just as bad, if not worse, than heroin or barbiturates or anything else. I don't know, if 60% of people go out to drink and get drunk, chances are that they're going to lead to something else and they're going to end up on the downward spiral. I may not be very old, but I have definitely seen some hellish things from alcohol. I didn't, to be honest, I didn't think someone could get to the point that I was at at my age. I thought that took years and years, but no, downward spiral. It might seem fun at the beginning, but after you get stuck in that lifestyle for years, you realize how not fun it is. It's terrifying. Okay, um, what I want you to do is to uh, get a blank piece of paper, and this is something that I normally do in class, but I'm not going to be able to have a discussion. It's just too hard with the, the, the lapse that we have uh, with the time, seeing the comments, and then coming back. So uh, basically, let's see if we can, if you can see this. Okay. I I want you to drive, uh, draw two circles, one with driving and one with drinking. And we all know that uh, to get a license in New Hampshire, the earliest you can do it is the age of 16. And from your reading and from experience, you know that the earliest that you legally can consume alcohol is age 21. So these two circles are what we're going to say these two worlds are separated by five years. But if we go by statistics, and I do this in class, and I usually go around, uh, this is interesting because your parents may be around watching this video or seeing what you're doing. Um, I usually go around the room and try to figure out how many of you have had some experience with, with alcohol. And if statistics bear out correctly, and they usually do, uh, six out of 10, uh, sophomores will have had some experience with alcohol. Now, I'm not talking about being, you know, stumbling drunk. I'm not talking about passing out. Um, I'm talking about uh, having a couple sips, having a serving, a glass of wine or something. And I'm not trying to pass judgment, uh, whether your parents are the ones that gave it to you or whether it was through, I don't know, church or whatever, when you said I had a sip of wine for communion, I understand that's uh, symbolic in a lot of uh, churches. But the thing is, is that the older that you get, 17, 18, 19, you're going to start hanging around people that are three, four times 
or three or four years older than you are, and they're going to be legal to drink, and it's going to kind of leak in to your um, environment. And what I want you to write down in your notes, and as we have from this right here, is that those two circles should never, ever, ever touch. Uh, the problem with most uh, people having problems with drinking and driving is they find themselves in a situation where they feel they're the only ones that can get themselves home and um, they justify and reason away uh, why they're behind the wheel of the car. And the other thing I've got down here, I should have left it up here. I want you to write down, oh, I'm, I don't know which way to move with this camera. Okay, why and why not? What I'd like you to do is to draw, like I have on the board here, uh, a line with why on one side and why not on the opposite. And I want you to list at least three reasons why you think people drink alcohol. And then I want you to give me about three reasons why you think people don't drink alcohol. Now, I don't want you to comment um, all three in the comments, but I would like you to take a moment right now and um, give me one example of why you think people consume alcohol and give me one reason why you think people don't. And while we're doing that, um, I'll play you another. Uh, it's kind of a lead into another movie. It's it's basically can you remember the first time so let me play have a shot here drink some of this have a shot the first time you do it you put yourself at risk because it takes a toll i drink to experiment and also to relieve Stress. There's always a reason to do it. I'm stressed. I don't like my parents. Oh, yeah. It goes to school, like, does what you see, what you do. You just want to fit in and, and you just want to try that out. Why is everybody else doing it? There must be something, you know, great about it. I was 14 years old when I tried weed with my friends. She had done it before I did, and she showed me it. She said it was okay to do it, and she liked it. And I tried it. It was just a new feeling that I needed to explore further. I started thinking if I only drank on the weekends, I wouldn't get addicted to drinking. But I don't think I'll get addicted though. Like, or to any type of drug. In the beginning, I, I felt like I was controlling it. But after that, it, it got out of control. Like, as I said before, I was, uh, I was high for six months. I mean, it was every day. I'd be back there in the alley smoking weed with everybody else. I drank so much that I started throwing up my stomach lining. My health deteriorated. I've lost homes. I've never been able to hold a job. I've lived in, on the streets. I ended up losing my scholarship in college. Everything I wanted to be just went down the drain. I could justify using in order to enjoy myself and other things. Just something I was dying. They opened the door for us and she was dead on the bed for the middle of the night. Gave him a shot of adrenaline to his heart and flatlined it and killed him right there. But when it's all over, I think we uh, all can remember the, the the first time. Well, this isn't really. Hmm. Let me get out of this. Huh. I'm going to go back to the other one. I guess I'm going to have to fix this uh, uh, tomorrow. It didn't format uh, correctly, so it's not going to be as, as big as it, as it should be. Actually, can I? Yeah, there we go. See if I can get a little bit bigger. Let's go back to uh, the reasons why and why not. Everybody's giving good examples. Um, I think if I was to ask you, if you were in class, do you remember the first time that you tasted alcohol? And you'd probably say yes. And you can probably remember who you were with, what you had. Um, you can remember the environment. It, it, it's one of those things that you just don't forget. Um, I usually tell people my personal stories. I can come from a family that uh, my mom and dad 
never drank alcohol, never saw him drink alcohol. Um, and I was a sophomore in high school. And the first time that I tried alcohol, I was with my best friend and I did not like it. Um, and I can remember tipping the drink over so I wouldn't have to finish it because I didn't like the taste of it, um, the taste of beer. And he kind of grew to like it. And his dad had a history of um, alcoholism and he kind of followed in the footsteps of his dad. Um, I'm teaching people not to drink and drive. And unfortunately, um, my friend from high school, he passed away in his 30s and he actually drowned in his own vomit in his bathtub. He was such a bad alcoholic that um, that's the way it ended for him. So you just never know when you're, you know, trying it out, experimenting with, with alcohol or drugs, where you're going to progress to. And that's not saying everybody goes at the same level or goes to the same point, but you, you have to know that, um, that if you're going to progress into some type of uh, drug use, that there really never is any good outcomes. And when it comes to driving, you have to be your best. Um, let's see, because this is all, okay. What I want you to write down is alcohol classified as a depressant. I think you probably know this from Q's class, but the thing that you probably don't realize is that a lot of people think that there are vitamins, nutrients, there's none. Okay. You have no nutritional value with drinking alcohol. And this is probably what comes to mind is people with, you know, the beer bellies. Um, they're getting all the calories, but they're not really getting anything to sustain life. Um, how come this is not moving on for me? Oh, there we go. So let's go through uh, some of the things. I do not want you to write everything down here. I just want to highlight a few things. If you've ever taken a sip of alcohol, I'm going to take a sip of water right now. The minute you put alcohol into your into your mouth, and if you were to go up to somebody, like if that was alcohol, if I was to go up to somebody, um, they could probably detect the odor of alcohol. So a lot of times people don't think that they smell of alcohol. And same thing with people that smoke. You know, they'll have a cigarette or whatever, and they think nobody knows. They can't tell. Oh, they can. They can. Uh, this is why a lot of people, when you get pulled over, the police will ask you the question, even though you think you're driving fine, they'll ask the question, have you had any alcohol tonight or have you, uh, you know, smoked um, pot tonight? And oh, no, no, no officer, no, but they're, they're smelling it. Uh, some of it gets into the lining of your mouth and then it goes to the stomach. Now, what I want do want you to write a few things down here is that your stomach is a holding tank for everything that you eat or drink. So someone that has consumed too much alcohol will have their stump, uh, their stomach pumped. You cannot have your small intestines pumped. Okay. It just isn't, it, you're not able to do that. So when you consume too much alcohol, for one thing, if you ever get sick drinking alcohol, your body doesn't want it. It's poison. So this is the reason why when the levels are getting a little bit too high, this is why your body is purging the alcohol. It doesn't want it any longer. So you have a built-in mechanism so the alcohol doesn't get absorbed into the bloodstream and you get high levels of alcohol poisoning. So you, you've got to have your stomach pumped if you have uh, too much alcohol in it. And the thing I want you to write down here is that between the stomach and the small intestines is something called a pyloric valve. And think of the valve like a door. It opens and it closes. So when you drink on an empty stomach, the alcohol just kind of shoots right into the small intestines and then to the bloodstream. But if you have food when you drink, that valve opens and closes, opens and closes, and small amounts of food and alcohol comes in at a, at a more steady rate and the alcohol is, is uh, dissipated. Um, it, it comes in at a slower rate and the level of your, uh, your BAC level is going to be a very slow climb than a rapid climb. Okay. And that's, that's really important. I do want you to write down the bloodstream takes, um, alcohol to your brain. And usually within 20 to 40 minutes, it's going to be circulating through your body. 
And the other thing I want you to write down, I know there's a lot there for liver, but what I want you to write down is one hour, one drink. That is the simple way to remember is that if you've consumed alcohol, let's say three or four drinks in two hours, okay, you've got four drinks in your system, it's going to take four hours, you've already got two uh, into the drinking process, you still should have another two or slightly over that before uh, you get behind the wheel of the car. So when you're around friends and they talk about having a six pack or drinking a pint or whatever of alcohol, you've got to kind of come up with a calculation of what is the safe time for me to be behind, be behind the wheel of the car. And we're going to see a little bit later in another video about you know, uh, the age of a person, the sex of a person, the weight of the person, all these things will come into play. So these numbers can kind of get a little bit fuzzy. They're not really clear cut. Uh, it can give us a range, but you, you have to understand is that uh, the longer the time, the better off you're going to be uh, with drinking um, alcohol and having it burn up. So it's absorbed through the liver at about a rate of one uh, drink per hour. Uh, it's oxidized uh, through your uh, breath, uh, perspiration, and urination. That's how we get rid of it. Um, really don't need to know that uh, for the test. And I just put this in here of uh, the different systems in the body that will be affected by alcohol. So the longer that you drink and the more of a problem that you have with alcohol, then this is going to be um, certain uh, parts of your body. Uh, will be affected uh, adversely. Okay, we already saw that video. Let's... Okay, we're going to uh, take a look at um, how it affects your your mind. Let's see if this works. Let me get back. It may be legal, but it is still a drug. Be safe, be sensible, know your limit. Alcohol is a drug too. Think before you drink. Your body belongs to you. The purpose of this presentation is to help you understand the impact that alcohol has on your brain and the damage it can do. Our goal is to provide you with information which will enable you to make informed choices in relation to safe alcohol consumption. Did you know? Healthy people metabolise alcohol at a fairly consistent rate. As a rule of thumb, a person will eliminate one standard drink or 10 mils of alcohol per hour. And remember, it's not how many drinks you have, but how much alcohol you consume. Several factors influence this rate, including gender, age, height, weight, general health, the presence of food in the stomach, the concentration of alcohol in the drink, and prescription or illicit drugs taken by the person. It's the blood alcohol concentration, or BAC, which is the key to why we are affected by alcohol. Basically, your blood alcohol concentration is the relationship between the total amount of alcohol in your system divided by total body water, because alcohol is dissolved and diluted in water. So that's also why drinking lots of water with any alcohol consumption is a really good thing. The BAC and the effects of alcohol go up when the body is taking in alcohol faster than it can metabolise it. For example, if you binge drink and consume a 750ml bottle of rum or three bottles of wine, that's around 26 standard drinks, between 6pm and 2am, your body will need until sometime around 6pm the next day to process and get rid of the alcohol. And that's why driving or operating equipment the next day is not only illegal, but just crazy. Particularly when you consider what this is doing to your brain. Let me explain. 
Alcohol enters the body and ends up in the stomach, at which point about 20% is absorbed immediately and the other 80% is absorbed in the small intestine. The heart then pumps the absorbed alcohol to every part of the body, including the central nervous system, which consists of the brain and spinal cord, and it gets to the brain really fast. So that's why even after just one drink, you can feel lightheaded or relaxed. Alcohol acts primarily on the nerve cells within the brain and interferes with communication between nerve cells and all other cells, slowing everything down. And that's why when we drink even a little, we experience the effects of alcohol on our emotions, judgment, balance, memory, speech and anger levels, just to name a few. Did you know that your brain is still developing until you're around 20 to 25? So we need to be really careful because alcohol can do some irreversible damage to various parts of our brains. For example, drinking affects the cerebral cortex, which controls our senses and inhibitory centers, which is why when you drink, you become more talkative, more self-confident and less socially inhibited. It also controls our thought processes, so alcohol affects our ability to make good judgment or think clearly. The brain's frontal lobes are important for planning, forming ideas, making decisions and using self-control. So when alcohol affects the frontal lobes of the brain, you may find it hard to control emotions and urges, and you may act without thinking, and even sometimes become violent or act completely out of character. Does this sound familiar? The cerebellum is important for coordination, thinking and being aware. So again, you may have trouble with these skills when alcohol affects the cerebellum. That's why people affected by alcohol sometimes can't walk properly or lose their balance and fall. The hippocampus is the part of the brain where memories are made. So when alcohol reaches the hippocampus, you may have trouble remembering something you just heard, or even worse, have a blackout and not be able to remember what you did last night. If alcohol damages the hippocampus, you may find it hard to learn or remember things in the future. The hypothalamus is a small part of the brain that does an amazing number of the body's housekeeping chores. After a person drinks alcohol, blood pressure, hunger, thirst and the urge to urinate increases, while body temperature and heart rate decreases. And finally, the medulla controls the body's automatic actions, such as your heartbeat. It also keeps the body at the right temperature. Because alcohol chills the body, drinking a lot of alcohol outdoors in cold weather can cause a person's body temperature to fall below normal. This dangerous condition is called hypothermia. Your body belongs to you. Get the facts. Alcohol is unsafe for the developing brain. Alcohol can damage your brain forever. The long-term functioning and health of your brain depends on the choices you make today. Your responsible attitude toward alcohol can have a positive influence on your friends and family. Your body belongs to you. Take care of it. It's the only one you have. Okay, let's kind of take a look at uh, what they were talking about and, and put this in your notes so you have a basic understanding of how uh, BAC and, and Josie mentioned BAL, which is blood alcohol level. It's basically the same thing. So as you increase the intake of alcohol into your body, you're sedating it. So think about if you've ever been operated on, okay, you had an anesthesiologist over you to make sure that your heart rate and your breathing and respiration, everything, all your vitals were in check and they gave you a gas or gave you a drug and they kind of kind of bring your body down to where you don't feel pain and you don't wake up in the middle of the operation. Well, you probably don't realize this, but alcohol does the same thing. It sedates you. You are bringing your, your body and your mind um, down, down, down until you, the levels are so high that you're going to die from alcohol poisoning. So let's kind of take a look at the stages of influence here. And I don't want you to write down anything except what it's at the very top level right here, okay? So let's kind of go through the first one. From 0.05 to uh, 0.01 to 0.05 is what we call sobriety. You're basically sober. Um, your parents probably consume alcohol. They probably go out to eat and have a couple beers or glasses of wine with a meal or you go to a sporting event and they're perfectly fine to get behind the wheel of a car uh, after time has passed to drive home. 
okay, you, you can drink uh, responsibly and drive well. The problem is, is that as a teenager, and this is something that's new to you, and you probably have friends that have experienced this, that they're not drinking in control. And a lot of people say, how come the United States doesn't uh, go to what Europe does and just make it where anybody can drink because there's no drinking age in a lot of um, uh, countries? Well, they were brought up a certain way to re uh, respect uh, drinking. And if you were to take a look at the rules and the laws in other countries, and we're going to see this tomorrow, is that their level of what is legal to do is much, much lower. So since people know that they can't drink to the level that they can in the United States, that they let more time pass or they let someone else drive, they find other ways to get, get around when there's alcohol that's involved. So uh, that is um, sobriety. The next one, and this is where most people fall into um, when they drink, uh, going out to eat, is euphoria. You feel um, a slight buzz. Uh, you can feel a slight uh, effect of the alcohol, but it's nothing that is making you um, not in control of your body or the vehicle. And the only way that we can usually tell that someone uh, is at this level is with, with testing, like we said on the last one too. Uh, but notice there's a range. Okay, it is illegal uh, in New Hampshire and every other state in the country here to drink at a level of 0.08 and above. So euphoria is on the high end, 0.08 to 0.12 is definitely where you should not be behind the wheel of a car. For people under the age of 21, you should know this for the test next week is 0.02. 0.09 to 0.25, and some of these numbers will kind of overlap too, is excitement. And this is probably where you probably see a lot of your friends um, that have been experimenting with alcohol and they're drinking, you know, four, five, six, seven drinks is where they have a decrease in inhibitions, loss of critical judgment, impairment of um, memory, decreased sensory response, and muscular in coordination. Now, Normally in class, what I would do is I'd take someone that would admit that they have never tried alcohol before, and maybe you can try this at home. Make sure you have someone watching you so you don't you know, break anything. But if you were to get in the room and spin yourself around real fast and then try to walk in a straight line, your body is going to go back and forth trying to balance the fluid that's in your ear and you're going to look like you would at this level. So if you spin yourself around and try to walk, there's going to be a hesitation or a stuttering or a stagger to your walking. And that's going to show you you're at this level. All right. The next one is confusion. Now, this is pretty dangerous. Dis, uh, disorientation, dizziness, exaggerated emotional states, altered state of perception, decreased sense of pain. So this would be like a college student that can fall down a set of stairs, maybe break a leg and not even know that they've broken a leg until the next morning. Impaired balance, staggered gait. Um, all things that definitely you do not want to be behind the wheel of a car. Uh, the only uh, homework that I'm going to give you, um, and you can write this down right now, is to go online and find an article about a drunk driver and you have to have a BAC level or a BAL level or uh, whatever um, in the article. And I just want you to send me the link or send me a picture of the article because we're going to be talking about uh, penalties of people. And this was part of your homework. Some of you haven't done it. Uh, what is the penalty for someone that's caught drinking and driving? What's the penalty for someone that gets caught um, crashing into someone where someone's uh, injured or dies. What should the penalties be? Now, guaranteed, anybody driving at a 0 .18, 0 .30 isn't that level where they're not going to be able to control the car. Uh, if they are getting home, it's only by luck. Uh, because if anything uh, that calls for a quick reaction, they're not going to be able to do it at, at this level. It's just, it's just not possible. Uh, the next one, point, uh, 0.27 to 0.40 uh, is stupor, and this is general inertia. What that means is that you, you're not moving. You're sitting down in a chair or a couch, and you're not getting up. You're not moving around. Uh, you don't respond to people. 
you're not responding to stimuli, you can't stand up, you can't walk, um, you may vomit. As we said earlier, your body wants to purge alcohol, doesn't need it, it's a poison. So at this point, the body's saying, hey, I don't want any more, and it's getting rid of it. Um, you may even lose control of your body function, so you may mess yourself. Um, that's a dead giveaway. I think if you ever watch, what was the um, the uh, Lady Gaga uh, movie with uh, Bradley Cooper? Remember when he came up on stage? He had, you know, peed his pants. Okay, he was a raging alcoholic. He he was at this level. Okay, he was a raging alcoholic. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the movie. It escapes me. Can't even remember right now. Um, a Star is Born, right? I think so. Um, what I want you to write down in your notes right now, this is probably one of the most important things that I talk about with BAC level. So please, 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 please write this down. If you have friends and if you are truly a friend, if you see anybody exhibiting any of this type of behavior, a good friend will call um, 911. Do not find a way to get them home. Do not find a way just to uh, let them sleep it off. They need medical help. I cannot tell you how many articles that I have read in the paper where people have just left someone alone in a corner or left someone to sleep it off for the night. Or in this case, the one that comes to mind, and this happened, I think, last year at a uh, university in Pennsylvania at a fraternity where someone drank so much alcohol, they fell down the stairs and they left them at the bottom of the stairs, passed out. Well, the alcohol s still was being brought into his system because he didn't purge it and he actually uh, suffered death by alcohol poisoning, all right? Um, you need medical help at this level because the next two slides that I'm going to show you um, is coma, um, subnormal temperatures we saw in the video, uh, non-control of your body functions, and only less than 15% of the dry of the drinking population can actually get to this level and live. Most of us would purge out the alcohol. Most of us would pass out. Most of us would never get to this level. Okay, our body just wouldn't allow us to do it. But there are people that are uh, alcoholics that can drink to, to this level and come back. I'm going to show you an article, one that I found. And then uh, death does happen at some point. Your level gets to be too high and you just die from alcohol poisoning. But this is the highest uh, BAC level that I have found. So maybe you can top this. But if you look at the uh, article real quick, uh, she's 45 years old from Dakota, South Dakota. She was found unconscious by authorities in a stolen delivery van. So there's bad judgment. Uh, it was revealed that she was driving under the influence of alcohol. Uh, alcohol was found uh, in her possession. Uh, she was nine times of the legal limit. Her BAC level, oh, look at that. I can get really high, is 0 .70, 0 0.70 was her level. And after they released her, a week later, they found her again in another vehicle drinking and driving. And that's what I really want you to start thinking about with your two paragraphs is that how do you stop people from getting behind the wheel of a car after they've been drinking or doing drugs? You just can't shake your finger at them and say, don't do that again. Or Sometimes a fine doesn't do it. Sometimes loss of license doesn't do it. Sometimes we have to separate them from the drug. And imprisonment is something that we need, plus education. So if you haven't done it, and I'd say probably uh, only half of you have done it, uh, you've got to do that. You've got to do your homework uh, to get credit. I'm, I'm so thankful that it, I think we've got everybody here today, which is, I think is almost the first. Oh, no, Hannah's not here because she's working. But um, um, good job with that. Um, let's take a look at what happens when you do become addicted to alcohol. I started drinking on a daily basis when I was about 14 years old. I had, I had drank alcohol a few times before that, but I started drinking every day in the ninth grade of high school. And I finally left home when I was 16 years old. I just left home, went to Daytona Beach, and stayed there until I, was, until I turned 17, and I joined the military. I did good, I made rank. Um, 
I actually went through my first rehab when I was 21 years old. I was about eight months shy of getting out of the Navy. So drinking definitely, uh, I was good at it. It helped relieve uh, these problems that I had. I could close the doors, whatever. Um, and this went on um, for, for years. Uh, for 26 years, I drank like that morning till night. In the morning, it didn't really matter if the beer was cold or not. I just needed it. Sometimes I would just wake up. Uh, I think my body would wake me up, to be honest with you. But I would be shaken, and um, I would uh, go out in the carport, or like I said, go to the refrigerator, grab at least two beers. And uh, sometimes I would, you know, the first one would come back up, but then after that it would stay down. And after about three or four, then I could pour a cup of coffee, talk on the phone, start doing what I had to do. My rock bottom came um, when uh, I, I was so afraid to drink anymore because I was having blackouts during the day. Couldn't remember talking to clients. I couldn't do finances. I couldn't run my business. I couldn't do anything. And, um, you know, I just totally thought that I was a failure. I thought that I. I was no good for anything anymore. I just, I just knew if I didn't get help, it was over. That I would just go home and I would either drink myself to death or my wife would, you know, it would be it. You know, I was very emotionally unbalanced and I was a wreck. And uh, that's how I knew, I just, I knew it was it. That was, I definitely hit my bottom. Turning Point uh, gave me the life I, I think I should have always had. They gave me assignments to do, which I worked on. Um, the biggest thing I started doing was talking, was sharing what was going on with me and how I felt. But um, between the the um, assignments I was given, um, starting to pray, opening it up, being honest about what was going on with me, I started to see a little something there. I started to feel like I was worth something. Just that there was a place for me and that, um, that I was lovable, that I was worth something, that um, I could overcome the, uh, the obstacles in my life, that I, that I could get past all these things that I didn't think I could ever get past before, all the reasons I drank. And um, that it was a disease That I, could, that I could continue life and never drink again. That I came to, to really believe that in my, the core of my being. I've surrendered completely, and it's a great, great feeling. Turning point basically saved my life. Because I, I, if I didn't come here, if I didn't come to Turning Point, I don't believe I would have a family or anything today. Okay, let's talk about alcohol addiction. We were talking about the BAC levels and people that are having a real rough time um, with controlling their drinking. So what I want you to do is to write down in your notes that there are, are basically three ways that you can uh, get help to solve a problem of addiction, whether it be alcohol or drugs. Okay, one would be AA or NA. Um, one would be uh, rehab, okay? You could go to a special um, center where you're gonna be staying for a certain period of time, like a week, two weeks, a month. And those of you that haven't done your penalties, that might be something for you to look at. And then there could be uh, counseling, 
which would be one-on-one. -on -one. That's what we call um, outpatient. Um, and I believe that the only way that you're going to get to turn your life around, as you saw in that video, is to be able to talk to somebody else that will help and guide you and support you to change behavior. Now, you're still pretty young, uh, but I will guarantee you when you graduate from high school and you come back to Oyster River uh, for a class reunion, 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, you're going to start hearing stories of people that you went to school with that have fallen and have had problems with alcohol or drugs. I mean, we live in a world and a society where people are afflicted by, by this. And I think it's important to be a help to those um, that need help. And a lot of times, as you could see from this story, is that people don't change their life until they hit rock bottom. And just when you think enough bad things can ha happen in someone's life, that this must be the turning point. This may be uh, what they really need to give them a kick in the pants to, to change what they're doing, and they'll find another level. Um, about 15, 20 years ago, I actually worked for the state of New Hampshire in their alcohol uh, drug abuse uh, program, and I was dealing with drunk drivers and the educational component that we have here in New Hampshire is what I basically oversaw. So a lot of these stories uh, are all too familiar to me. I would be sitting in and listening to people tell their stories, and it would be hard not to just kind of tear up a little bit to hear how far people have gone to throw their life away, and now they're trying to turn it around. So I wanted to make sure that you um, have a basic understanding that, um, as a lot of people said, the reason why people drink is to have fun. But on the flip side, um, there's a negative part to that, is that if you do not know how to control it, it, it it's like an equation. It, it flips on you at some point. You, and a lot of times you never know when it flips. You think you're controlling it. Later in life, it flips over. It's controlling you. And what you find with an alcoholic, they, and this is the thing that I want you to remember is that alcoholics and drug addicts don't just do alcohol and drugs to feel um, high anymore. They're just trying to feel normal. They're drinking or drugging just so they can maintain to have any type of a life. And that's still going to get them. That is still not the way to be. They've, they've got to, once you become an alcoholic or an addict, you, you just got to cut it out. You can't control it. Um, let's see what's the next slide here because we're getting right near the end. I'm going to show Jackie tomorrow. Same thing with um, the eyes don't lie. I think I had um, one more. I think I had, I'm going to go through all. Oh, it didn't come in. Maybe I'll find it. Um Okay, we'll come back uh, tomorrow and we'll pick up with Jackie's story. So if you haven't done chapter 18 and you haven't done the um, two paragraphs of those that are convicted and those that are convicted of killing somebody, I want those penalties. And um, some of you typed it, Maddie, great job. Uh, so it's nice when I can actually read it. Now, I don't expect everybody to do that, but it's kind of hard when you're texting me it and it's all in pencil that I can't you know, necessarily see it that well. So try to make it where I can read it. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, and, oh yeah, remember the, the BAC in the article. So go online, find an article dealing with drunk driving and look what happened in the crash. Like I showed you the woman that stole the vehicle and her level was so high. You'll find that the higher the BAC, the more carnage, the more damage that they do to other people. So tomorrow we're going to focus more on penalties and more on drugs. So tomorrow's class is going to be um, what happens statewide um, throughout the country with people that are drinking and driving. So tomorrow will be penalties. So that's it for today. I hope everybody has a good evening. Thanks for uh, signing in and um, doing a good job. Remember to sign out. Text me that you're here to the very, very end. So I know that we went to about 515 today. Um, so see you tomorrow at 4 o'clock. And do your homework. Have a good night.